Let's do it again. You're up. All right. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see you. It really is nice to see your faces. I'm glad you have found us tonight for the second session of our spiritual physics research discussion. Uh, whether you are from First Church Unitarian in Littleton or another UU uh, person who got word or anyone who follows Doug online on his blog or his YouTube channel or what have you, we're glad you're with us tonight. Should be another great night. My name is uh, Laura Hoke and I'm the minister of First Church Unitarian in Littleton. And that is the congregation where Doug is a member along with his wife uh, and also their daughter attends. So I wanted to let you know just quickly what the format is. I will talk briefly and just sort of give a little bit of, um, of a sense of where I start to think of the topic spiritually and how it fits into that for me. And so after I speak for maybe six, seven minutes, uh, then Doug will give the, the bulk of the presentation for the evening going for about 35 minutes or so. And then there is time for discussion, um, which might take the form of a, a question you have about something Doug said or your own thought. So again, glad you're here. When I think of relativity, it really brings up for me the question of reality and how we see it and what is truth and all of those great basic questions. You know, Einstein, Albert Einstein, it was back in 1905 that he came up with the special theory of relativity. This stuff has been around a long, long time. And yet it still kind of boggles the mind. It's kind of incredible in that way. So the way Einstein saw things 115 years ago, he realized that Isaac Newton's version of reality and time couldn't be exactly completely correct, even though it seemed to explain things here on earth pretty darn well. And Einstein discovered that different people, different observers are gonna see things in different time sequences according to their own position, their own speed, velocity, uh, that there is no such thing as a universal now, which is really hard to wrap your head around. It becomes a spiritual question for me in part because in lots of religious language, you'll hear people talking about eternity. Hmm. Times people talk about eternity as in the ever after, but usually more advanced spiritual voices of all traditions will say that we are in eternity now. We're part of eternity. This is all part of eternity. But then again, what is now? So we're still back to this fundamental question. Einstein said the most beautiful and most profound emotion we can experience is the sensation of the mystical. It's the sower of all true art and science. To know that what is impenetrable to us really exists, manifesting itself as the highest wisdom and the most radiant beauty, which our dull faculties can comprehend only in their most primitive forms. This knowledge, this feeling is at the center of true religiousness. Religion, I'm sorry. <laughs> Part of and the that upsets dogs. Yes, yes, yes. The mind-blowing nature of these ideas is very upsetting to my dog. So just the nature of Zoom gatherings. One second, please. The uh, great physicist Schrodinger wrote an essay on Vedanta. And Vedanta is, of course, the wisdom tradition of Hinduism that I sometimes preach about in parts. And he was blown away, as am I, by the intuitive vision that Vedanta has, this ancient Hindu wisdom um, about our reality. And according to Vedanta, essentially nothing is real in the way that we normally think of things as being real. So he wrote an essay on Vedanta and said that the intuitive vision 
of Vedanta sees that ultimate physical reality in contemporary 20th century scientific terms rather than a Newtonian one. So they kind of were onto Einstein's vision thousands of years ago. They saw all sorts of avatars of God and goddesses in the way that they describe spirituality and in their mythology. But they always saw everything as part of the illusory realm of Maya. Maya is often translated to mean that all is an illusion. And in a sense, all is an illusion. One message of the Bhagavad Gita is that there is no such thing as objective reality. So this is an, an ancient mystical uh, obs observation as well. There is no such thing as reality. I'm gonna try to skip ahead because my dog is not being cooperative. My apologies. <laughs> and I don't have anyone here to rein him in. <laughs> so the world has no existence according to Vedanta. And what does that mean? It means it has no absolute existence. It only exists relative to your mind and my mind and everyone's mind. We see the world with our five senses, but it's asked if we had another sense, would we see it, the world in more senses than five? And I think the answer would be yes. So there's this notion that the absolute, the absolute truth is far more, far greater than anything we can imagine. And that we shouldn't drag the absolute or God, if you like that term, down to the level of our own understanding of the universe. And the Unitarian minister, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, dream delivers us to dream and there is no end to illusion. Life is like a train of moods, like a string of beads. And as we pass through them, they prove to be many colored lenses which paint the world their own hue. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Doug. And again, many apologies for the dog barking. Doug, Doug a member of our church, as I said, um, a graduate of MIT, class of 84, studied biology and chemical engineering. And then in a, he went on to Brandeis and got a master's in software engineering. So he is wicked smart. And uh, he's <laughs> a fun and creative thinker and uh I'd like him to take over now. So, Doug, take us away. All right. Sounds good. Okay. So, uh, about me, hey, Laura already went over this. Uh, in fact, most of these points, except that I like to say that I really focus on creativity, uh, which is a competition uh, between imagination coming up with crazy stuff and logic, which says that's crazy. <laughs> You can't do that. Um, I am not a professional physicist. I am call myself a fringe physicist because I'm not um, financed by anybody. Um, but I try to be ultra orthodox in that I really do try and knock ideas down. Um, but if they stand back up, um, well, I'll, I'll let them play cause, and enjoy them. Okay. So this is the outline uh, for tonight's uh talk, we're going to uh, look at the t-shirt first, and um, then we're going to do a brief review of what we did the last in the first um, one of our discussions. And then I'm going to bring a, up a, a couple of spiritual ideas, and I gave you uh, visual hints um, right there. And then we're going to go uh, into relativity. And um, it's been interesting that just preparing for these talks has actually considerably shifted how I think about these things. And believe me, that was like really fun. Okay, so relativity is about two people and they are looking at exactly the same thing. Um, in this uh, t-shirt that I've, I've got here, um, we've got three different characters, not two. Why is that? Well. Actually, you're going to have to wait a month 
to talk about that guy who's uh, floating up above because that's uh, gravity uh, seems to change things, how things look. Um, but again, you'll find some agreement, but that's the way it goes. So what we're going to talk about today is the bottom two figures, uh, me here, uh, me here now, and um, Zippy you, and Zippy you is, uh, is special relativity. And uh, so what I say is that precise, and I put a big arrow there, um, because when people say relativity, they often get the sense of, oh, you know, it's kind of, it's very squishy, right? It's relative, it's squishy. <laughs> and it turns out that, that you couldn't be more wrong about the squishiness. Uh, it's extremely precise. To measure relativity, you don't need a watch. You need an atomic clock. <laughs> and that is really precise. Uh, so precise relative disagreements about things um, actually lead to calculate, uh, calculated agreements. And that's what we'll, we'll show. Um, and uh, as it says on the back, uh, we all see the universe differently, and yet we can all agree on parts of squares. Uh, and in, that, in this case, we're looking at two things blowing up because, you know, physicists like blowing up things. They're kind of like that. Cool. So we're going to just have a little meditation on these, uh, what I consider the five most important equations uh, in physics. And, and as I say, that's a non-standard opinion. Usually it's some guy's equations, not these that don't even have equations. As a matter of fact, I think if you told a physicist, hey, I met somebody at church who thought this equation meant something, they probably wouldn't buy buy it <laughs> but okay so we've got the zero plus zero equals zero and zero times zero equals zero and the idea there is that it's like Thich Nhat Hanh's um, discussion of a booting Buddhist concept of the importance of being present and that you can't be anything but present so why is that well that might be related to this and then as a result of this kind of series, I said, well, what does one times one equal one equal? And I came to a conclusion that uh, the past remains the past. And there's literally nothing you can do about it. And then zero plus one equaling uh, one is about in the here now, in the present, which is the only place you can ever be, you can remember your past, at least as long as you're healthy. And then zero times one equals zero because the multiplication sort of thing is tr cannot take that one, that past, and bring it up to here now, despite all the billions of dollars that have been made up uh, uh, in Hollywood on movies that assume tri time travel is, of course, something you can do. Um, I think simple math says no. So in this, again, not too long, but what I want you to do is actually have different ones of those equations kind of battle each other a little bit uh, inside your own mind. May I ask a question? Sure. Starting with the top row, you say zero plus zero equals zero. I'm just curious, why are there four zeros separated by commas? And, and all the way through it, there's four digits all separated by commas. But you only uh, refer to them either, either as a zero or a one. Well, yeah, that's language for you. Uh, it's because these are all space time. These are all space-time numbers. So one of the positions, the first one, as a matter of fact, is for time. And then there's like one for X, one for Y, and one for Z. Are you talking so about four positions within the paragraph, within the parentheses? Yep, yep, yep. yep. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. 
Yay, no problem, no problem. All right, so let's move along. Um, and so uh, Reverend Laura wondered, you know, about zero boxes and, and things like that. And uh, in fact, yeah, what's a zero box? And I actually don't think it's a well-formed question. And an example of that is what is one plus equal? And you go, well, you, you forgot something. <laughs> uh, and I think a lot of these simple questions that don't seem to have answers, don't have answers because they're not well formed. It's not that, you know, if you thought about it a little harder, no, you, you can never answer what does one plus equal. Is this so? How about this simple question? Well, I think you can think of negative boxes and positive boxes. So, in this case, we've got a box now that would be that yellow one, let's say the, the far away one, and a negative block now. And that's why it's up, it's to the left, it's you know, it's up, is, is it's it's down. Okay. Um, and so now, by the way, means zero time. The time is zero. Um, so that's how I enter, uh, understand this negative block. But what if these things had time associated with them? What if you had a block that was uh, ha had minus three to zero and zero to plus three? And uh, well, then you would get, let's see if this works or not, because you know, Oh, look at that. So, so it's the same two blocks in terms of space, but they're also doing positive time and negative time. And you say, well, which one's the positive time and which one's the negative time? Uh, I'm not sure it matters, which is kind of nice. Uh, in fact, you can't tell whether the spaces are, are positive or negative. Um, but to me, that feels more co a concrete answer about uh, blocks being plus and blocks being minus, whether we decide to do it in now, in which case you can see both of them, or you put time in there. So that's at least is my effort to give a kind of con more concrete answer uh, to Reverend Laura's uh, question. Okay, so, uh, but nothing is permanent. Uh, and there are these San Mandelas, and they certainly influenced uh, thinking about them, influenced my thinking about uh, space time. So, you know, they will spend more than five years studying a particular um, uh, Mandela, and they actually meditate about it. And this Mandela has an awful lot to it. <laughs> okay. This is, uh, I think I said in the, uh, pre-discussion that this is called uh, the wheel of life and it has a um, a snake it has a um, a chicken or rooster and it has a pig and the snake is about anger the pig is about ignorance and I think the rooster is about envy and then around that it's got this light and dark circle and then around that, it's got the six-part circle. And then around that, it's got a 12-part circle. The 12-part circle is got uh, a bunch of things about the inner relatedness of things. And that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Each one of those symbols is understood to mean something particular. And you, not, not only do you have to learn how to draw it by rubbing on this funnel, um, with your colored sand, <laughs> uh, but you need to know the, the, the relationship to all these other things. So you can see that that takes just quite uh, an impressive amount of um, dedication. And then after this huge thing is constructed, then they have a ritual, a ceremony, everybody's you know, just got to be happy at the, at the beauty of this thing. And then they sweep it all up. And that really makes concrete this idea of the temporary nature of things. And yet, in another way, it's exactly the opposite. Because they've been doing this, this kind of Mandela, this, this 
particular Mandela, like for like a thousand years or more, I, I, I don't know the exact uh, longevity of this one, but there are a variety of these Mandelas around. So they keep telling the story of anger versus ignorance versus envy um, in this way. And so uh, that's kind of, that's very deep kind of stuff going on there. Okay, so space-time numbers. Uh, I'm calling them space-time numbers so that that's maybe a, a better hint that it has both time and space with it. Um, and they're not permanent. And that is because, you know, space-time has got this transient quality to it. And it really feels to me like there's this conflict between this view of numbers and, you know, you know Euclidean's, I'm sorry, yeah, the Euclidean ideal of getting things that are like permanently true and everlasting sort of thing. So there are all kinds of basic questions you can ask, like, you know, well, how can you have this permanent here now and yet get a past, <laughs> a past that seems to be getting older? And uh, and it's it's funny, sometimes I feel like, oh, yeah, that's that's obvious. And then catch me in another moment, I'll go, why did that happen again? <laughs> well, it does. Uh, all right. And then I, I started thinking a little bit more carefully about, uh, uh, I'm not going to pronounce this right, but Tejutsu uh, uh, symbol. Um, this was from China. And uh, it's originally much more complicated. And they just simplified it uh, until, you know, it was able to get, get over to the West. Um, and the white is... Uh, is is uh, yang? It is male, and the the yin is dark. It's female. I, I don't. I think you'll know which one is the strong symbol and which one's the weak symbol. So uh, it did um, reflect the cultures of the time. Uh, but the reason I did it this way is because the importance of duality. That if you just talk about one, you really are missing. Uh, important elements of it um, that you really have to, to me, I kind of insist on it, I should say. <laughs> and so th this is how I'm kind of uh, spinning uh, yin yang. I'm saying, you know, there's time and there is space, um, but you really, really, really uh, have to talk about space dash time. And a lot of physicists I know and I profoundly respect We'll talk just about time. And I, I would say to such a person, that is not correct. You really have to get the discipline of talking about space time to help you resolve some of these really hard riddles that remain in, in physics. I would say the same thing about energy and momentum. Now the professionals know that those two are related to each other. They know exactly how they're related to each other. They know exactly how to do it. And yet, I don't know that I've heard of a uh, physicist really in a disciplined way always talk about energy momentum. And I think that's a shame because I think at the end of this talk, I'll, I'll at least give you a flavor of, of why that might be kind of more fun uh, to think of things with that dash in there. So there's this tension between energy, which is kind of a shared time-like thing and uh, momentum, which is, you know, it, it moves, it goes in space. And then there is mass squared energy times momentum. No, no one, no one uses this. Oh, okay, I do. Uh, <laughs> but if you take energy momentum, energy and these three momentums, so the, so it's just like time with one thing and three spaces, and you square it, you get mass squared, you get energy uh, times momentum in the kind of three sl slots for space. And I think, yeah, you say, that's really awkward. <laughs> it's not efficient. It's like, I don't care. I want to be consistent. So, uh, so that's one way in which I'm different um, and kind of built that way. All right. So, um, so why is relativity hard? 
And I think there are all these diverse teachers there, you know, you, you don't have to, you know, there are all these diverse teachers and they stress different things. And I don't think they're stressing the right thing. And namely that you've got two people and they're looking at the same thing. So if you've got two people, well, they're actually going to be in two different spots in the world. And they are therefore going to not get the original data just the same. And yet because they are looking at the same thing, we'd better be able to do some math <laughs> of some sort and figure out how can they agree to something when they're looking at the same thing. That's the goal. All right. So let me give you an example of this where I think there's a lot, uh, a, a yang sort of thing. The speed of light is constant. Well, that's true. The speed of light is constant. So what do they disagree about? And there, there are some people who actually, they know the answer, <laughs> okay? It's not like uh, I'm, I'm telling them anything new. They know the answer. They don't share it as in, uh, in the discussion. And so I think that's where the logic struggles happen. Okay, so I've got here um, a speeding train. Uh, there's a guy on the speeding train and he fires off um, uh, a sparkler or something uh, on the front of the train, on the rear of the train, and he times it just perfectly so that he, can he sees both of them explode at exactly the same time. Uh, in the word of words of uh, special relativity, simultaneously. He says they, they blew up at the same time. And then there's a person behind the train and there's a person in front of the train. Now that person in front of the train, okay, light takes a while to get to him. And so it's gonna take less time for the uh, light in the front of the train to get to him than the one in behind the, uh, at the caboose there because it's further away. So it's not gonna be simultaneous. And the same goes true for the person behind the train because she's going to see the caboose light first and then the one in the front. So which one's right? It's like, no, they're all right. Okay. But we need math to handle the fact that they're all right. The guy in the train really does see things happen simultaneously, those two explosions. The guy in the front really sees the first the, the, the one in the, 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 the engine, the light there first, and he sees the caboose second, and the person in the back sees it the other way. Uh, now, these change, these differences, again, ridiculously small. It's because light is literally a million times faster than um, the speed of sound. And so, um, so that's why you need atomic clocks and all kinds of very sensitive measurements, but it's based on this sort of thing. Okay, and so people say, yeah, but I wanna go faster than the speed of light, please, because I don't know, I feel like it. <laughs> and uh, this is actually a piece of artwork that uh, is in my dining room. Um, and because I don't think the speed of light is about a speed, it was just about a speed, um, yeah, you should be able to go faster. But it's about time's relationship to space. That let's say you're really, 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 really slow. And, and if that's the case, then I can sit around and talk to you about stuff for a really, really long time. And that's what that coil thing uh, on, um, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna say left or right, the one that has lots of coils. <laughs> So if, if you and I are, are hanging out, I can tell you stories until you want to go to sleep. Now, if we're moving at some rate, then, you know, I can tell you a few stories and then I could tell you. And then if you're moving at a faster rate relative to each other, fewer stories. And then the final panel, unfortunately, uh, you know, it hangs up in my house and the piece fell out. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know where it is. <laughs> this is living with art. Uh, it's supposed to be just a straight, straight line um, thing. Um, so that is where time is space. And that at least was what, what I hope. And so, I, in fact, it says in French, let's see if I can read my French here. Uh, the speed of light C is not a velocity and there is no time without space, no space without time. The piece is called uh, The Speed of Light According to Rene Magritte, for those of you who know your art uh, history. All right, so <clears throat> I'm gonna teach you the simplest form of relativity that you, ex you have to accept. You have to accept this, because <laughs> it's not hard. Um, it, I call it ruler relativity. And this was known to the Egyptians. It's also known as surveying 101. Um, but because I'm now have to put these dashes in, including the time, uh, it was kind of fun when I realized, you know, me, I'm the only person who gets to be now. <laughs> All others, they are thens. They are in the past. They're not in the future because we never can get to the future. Uh, and uh we all see things differently because look, you're in a different spot on that circle, okay? But we are looking at the interval between left then and right then. And since we're looking at the same darn thing, we better have a way of calculating the same value. And since those are right uh, triangles, we get to use Pythagorean's theorem and say x squared plus y squared. Those are my measurements, thank you very much equals that that distance and that uh, distance squared, I should say. Uh, and then you with your X prime and your Y prime have X prime squared plus Y prime squared. Uh, that equals mine. And so we agree, all right? We disagree about the initial X's and Y's. We agree about those squares. So what did Einstein do? Well, he made a, Small tweak, <laughs> small tweak. He said, hey, let's include time in these sorts of things. And so when you do that, you then say, oh, there's an X dash T, an X, X and a T, and you have an X prime and a T prime, and there's a Y and a T and a Y prime and a T. And so, well, do we get all the squares in there? Sure, we do but there's that minus sign in there. And again, one of the things that came out of this exercise that I thought was so interesting was that minus signs do a lot more strangeness than I kind of had given them credit for. You know, minus was just like, oh, that's just no big deal. Things don't get really weird, but no, they really do get weird um, because it's a minus sign. I haven't fully comprehended that, but anyway, that's okay. So this is, anyway, this is the math behind what's on the t-shirt, that the x and x primes are not equal, you're seeing things differently, and yet you are agreeing on the interval. Okay, so now the rest of this talk is gonna be about the space-time graphs, um, because uh, they show up extensively about special relativity, and I just started to realize that I'm seeing these things so differently now than I did like uh, three months ago. Uh, because as you can see there, for example, that uh, time and the future light cone, those are all positive, they're all up. And yet I've recently come to the conclusion that no, the positive numbers in a space-time uh, uh, physics, if you're going to use the space-time numbers, no, that's actually the past. Um, and, and the other big change for me was when I see a, a graph like this, you know, and I'm, a, I'm a little bit of an artist. I figure I can scribble anywhere. <laughs> you know, uh, why not? I got a pencil. I, I can have some fun. Um, but it turns out it's much more constraining than that, far more constraining. So, so we start with the Thich Nhat Han um, idea that the present, present is all there is. And so, um, so that would be right dead center there, me now, 
That's all there is. Well, then what's the rest of the stuff? <laughs> it's got to be stuff, right? Okay, well, we've got the space past. Okay, and that is unchangeable. You can't change the past. And that's part of the nature of time. And if we think about the space future, well, that too is unreachable. Uh, because, you know, you can't live in your future. You can only live in the present. And one of the uh, one of the new ideas uh, that came comes out of special relativity is uh, outside the light cone. See that light cone is that that big X there. And when we say this, um, you can't go faster than the speed of light. One of the things it's saying is, don't mess with the X. That X stays, no matter what. And if you're out, if something's outside that, then that's, you just can't get there from here. Uh, where here is literally uh, me now, right in the dead center like that. Okay, so you say, yeah, but you know, <laughs> change does happen. What happens to this? Oh, well, let me, one more thing. That calculation agreement curves, those are those little parabolas. Those are the things that when we square, we say, hey, your X and my uh, T, they're not the same, but when we square them and we put in that minus sign, hey, we agree to that value. It's an algebra thing. Uh, so uh, if you would you know, put your, your cursor over the uh, um, space past unchangeable due to time, right? That's at the top of the graph. Um, so it occurs to me that the opposite of that is that that um, you can't not change the future. That you can't change the past. You can't not change the future, which is Ooh. actually it was is, which is actually an awesome responsibility. You're responsible for the future. I like I, I like it. Yeah, that's great. Did you just come up with that now? Yeah. Well done. <laughs> nice. Top marks. No, hey, no, no. You know what he did? Yin Yang, people. He yeah. Yin Yang that. That was very <laughs> impressive. I, I, I will give you credit in the future for that idea. <laughs> okay. So, so how does this space time evolve? Because it does evolve and so that's what i'm trying to think about here and so the past well as it evolves i get more history i get older <laughs> uh and i get less future uh i'm closer to death that wonderful observation um so less future. And, um, and one of the things I realized was the light cone. What happens with the light cone? Well, it actually uh, shifts in both equally in both space and in time to get to the new now. And um, so, as I say, me now is uh, in the moment and the me past uh, gets older, uh, gets more aged. And the me future, I've got less time uh, to be here. And I, I think this whole uh, life thing outside the light cone, I'm not sure if it made it into the Buddhist tradition, uh, but perhaps it did. Um, we'll have to find out. Okay, so, uh, and, and this was a fun observation I had while creating this. And that is that if we think of grains of, uh, grains of sand time, uh, they would be flowing up here because we're taking something from the future and we're making it into the past. Now that's not exactly right because you know we've got that zero plus zero equals zero, which is an equivalence. They really are the same thing. And so it's still a little strange. Uh, I, at least I like feeling attention uh, about that sort of issue. Okay, so those five uh, uh, most important equations. Uh, when I when I first wrote that 
you know, we should meditate. I didn't actually think I would come up with a slide, <laughs> but I'm glad I did. We could actually see it on this uh, diagram here. So the, uh, the zero plus zero equals zero and zero times zero equals zero. It's just pointing at the, that point right in the dead center uh, of the graph. Um, that history uh, uh, has to remain itself is also there, the one times one equals one. And that we can remember the past um, is there, well, I forget which, well, and then, uh, yeah, it's the plus one. That's the remembering the past. And ver versus if I'm here now, I can't somehow drag the past to here now. So, uh, and I included a bonus. Why not? Uh, and that is this one with a zero, one squared. Or for you people who are into uh, complex numbers, that's like, I squared being equal to minus one, and that um, that one brings you yeah. So so zero that means now, uh, one means there. So it's it's not here. That's zero zero. It's now it's there now becomes future here, and it can do that. And you notice it the way it does that. If it, it's going parallel to uh, one of those light cone lines. You know, you fire a photon uh, and it would land right there um, in the future. So uh, I'm glad I included it. Okay, but there are serious limitations uh, to space-time. Uh, it's very me-centric. <laughs> uh, and this, of course, applies equally well to you. You, you live a you-centric life. Um, uh, at the, o the only thing, though, you can learn uh, about you is where, 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 when you are. Um, none, no other characteristics are possible because it's just position and time. Uh, and I'm also not a point. Although these diagrams kind of have instilled that as a as an idea, it's not only that the graph says you should treat everything as a point, but in some ways numbers seem to want to behave the same darn way. You know, they don't want to say, "Yeah, I've got this uh, this strange volume, and I've got this bump over here." The bump over here, I, it's actually kind of hard to deal with in terms of uh, the numbers, and yet. Nature has no problem uh, dealing with, with that kind of detail, all right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to remove me now. And we're going to do that by measuring you, hmm. uh, by using subtraction and creating something that's called a tangent space. Oh, there was a bit of jargon in there. But you can see that we have you like earlier uh, as a triangle up there at the top, and then you early, okay, so, um, and you're actually closer to now, me now. Um, and that's all I can learn about you using space-time. You were there, and then you're over there at a different time, okay? But now you can subtract those two. Now, when you subtract those two, you kind of draw a line between the two triangles, and take those two triangles and move them so the lower triangle, the new, newer triangle, ends up right at the origin. And all you end up with is, is one. So we used to have two lines to the, to the two triangles. Now we only have one line, the line between the two triangles. And me is gone. <laughs> and actually, I was thinking, man, that's, that's what I should do. I should call space time a, a me space where I get to be in the center. And then I'll, I'll call the other one you, you space um, because I'm no longer there. It's just a quality about you that I saw. And uh, then I said, well, yeah, but there's more than one you out there, right? We've got more than one you on this Zoom call. So let's just look at, let's just try and think about three things. And it's, it's all the same, right? 
I've got, you know, three different collections of dots. I got triangles, I got rectangles, I got circles, and I get to see them at different times. I get to see them in different locations. They're moving differently. But since we've got three, uh, since we got two of them, the dots for each one of them, I can, you know, make my little triangle and, and shift it down. So all of them are right over the center again. It's like, and of course, this actually starts to feel overwhelming to me because, you know, the universe is pretty big and <laughs> I've only got three things and uh, it'd be a nightmare to actually fill this up with everything that's in this room currently. Um, but I like this idea of having a me space and uh, qualities of, of, of you space. Now, the, all the things that I've said before kind of have to carry over in the space and you'll, you'll get a sense that, yeah, those spaces look kind of similar. They're, they've got the light thing going on. They've got the, the triangles, uh, sorry, the, 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 the curved lines going on. Um, so aren't they mathematically going to have a lot, a lot of similarities? It's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, we just did a subtraction. It's not like it all, it's all broken, except that one subtraction got rid of me, which is kind of cool. All right. Um, so I think there are actually an enormous diversity of possible tangent spaces. And I'm only going to deal with one with you guys. <laughs> Because one's enough, okay? It's called energy momentum. And um, so it's got energy that goes uh, up and down and it's got momentum left and right. And this thing is going to be different for everybody. Stop. It's always going to be, we're, no one's going to be able to say their energy momentum graph is exactly the same because they've got that space thing. And because they're sitting in a slightly different place, the momentum is always going to be slightly different. Oh, not enough probably to matter ever, <laughs> but, but at least in theory, uh, it should always be a little bit uh, different. Okay, so, um, and we've got the curves of agreement, of course which is now mass squared uh, times energy um, times momentum. And that's the rather frightening uh, little uh, algebraic expression uh, for that. And if you say, I don't wanna know all those terms. Yeah, you don't have to, okay. But it does have uh, a mass squared as a result. That's what people agree upon. Now they don't agree to, to uh, energy times momentum but no professional f f physicist talks about energy momentum. And I think that's a problem when you don't talk about things that are perfectly fine to calculate. Uh, and, and because to me, the biggest mystery is how can we have these people who are smarter, more accomplished than I'm ever gonna be stumped? <laughs> I, I don't understand how you can stump people that are just, I've sometimes interacted with some of these people and it's just like almost, you almost feel scared at how smart they are. And uh, it's like the only stumpable possibility to me is they're not dealing with the full deck. And um, so that's, that's at least uh, an underlying thesis uh, of my work. Okay. So uh I'm going to push the envelope here because because uh, I think it's fun. Uh, and I was thinking about thoughts, okay, that happen right in someone's brain that are probably happening, in a, at, least, at least in a few of us. Um, that takes up a space-time volume because each nerve, you know, it takes up, I don't know, microliters worth of, of space. And um, they have, your neurons have energy. Uh, I'm kind of intimately associated with this because uh, because my diabetes sometimes my actually let me check where's my sugar level oh my sugar level's fine but if my sugar level goes too low my energy level goes too low I can't think <laughs> um, but there's also momentum to your neurons I mean the, when the signals move around in your head okay and as long as you've got an energy and you've got a momentum 
you can square that, you can come up with a mass. And he said, wow, wouldn't it be cool to do that calculation and say it was like this many picograms or nanograms or pico nanograms? <laughs> yeah, it would. I have not done that calculation. Uh, it's, a, it's unfortunately, uh, oh, I just haven't spent the time on it. I'm not sure it could even though. Uh, anyway, it's in theory. And so that actually uh, brings me back to like second life uh, question that uh, started out um, a discussion in the first one. Uh, that again, that takes space time. You know, you're, you're typing on a computer board and that definitely has space because you know the, the letters aren't all in the same spot or anything like that. And there's energy momentum going on there. Because if you flick the power switch off, <laughs> second life ain't happening, okay? But if you talk, think about the momentum situation, well, after you type it, energies, uh, th there's electrons, uh, not electrons, but electromagnetic waves that are going to various parts of the motherboard to say, hey, well, we're supposed to boot up. <laughs> we're supposed to create this person. And then, oh yeah, we got to take that turn it into some type of signaling system and send it out over a, an ethernet cable. Uh, maybe we go to Wi-Fi first, to, over to the router, and then we got to go to the data center. You know, things are moving to make this happen. And then it's going to be in the data center where it's probably be, going to be on three different computers at the same time. <laughs> but since there's an energy and a momentum, in theory, you can square that and come up with a mass squared for that. Now, there's theory and there's practice. I, <laughs> I'm not going to do the calculation. Uh, but at least I think there's a, a mass squared energy times uh, momentum associated with just playing um, uh, on the internet, like we're doing now. <laughs> All right. OK, so we've, we've reached it. We've reached uh, open discussion time. Um, How much time did I take? Who knows? Um, uh, so, uh, I'm here to listen to you folks and to try and answer things or to scratch my head because that's a perfectly fine things to do. And, um, and let's see, uh, whatever, uh, the, uh, there's the t-shirt, um, with the, uh, the three characters when we talked about the speedy relativity stuff, uh, tonight and, um, so I look forward uh, to having a, a good discussion with you folks. Thank you very much.